Today's teenagers are looking for hope. Suicide has become one of the leading causes of death among teens worldwide. We are called by God to eradicate hopelessness, and since January of 1993, we have been on the road ministering words of hope to teenagers in high schools across America and in nations around the world. Our message is simple. God loves you, He's got a plan for your life, and in Him, you matter. Hey everyone, I'm Dean Sykes. Welcome to our You Matter television broadcast. We are so thankful today that we get to have some time together. And you know, before we get even started, let's just pray together. Father, thank you for today, for what you're doing, what you will do on this broadcast. I ask that you give each of us eyes to see and ears to hear what you want communicated in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I have, um, I've been looking forward to, to being with you today because there's, um, there's something very specific that God has put on my heart for today's broadcast. And, and that happens every time we, we sit down to tape because we invest in a significant amount of time in the Word and in prayer because I don't want to just throw programs together. That, that, that doesn't interest me. What interests me is, Lord, what do you want communicated? Because He knows who's watching or who will be watching. And so our job is to hear His voice and obey His voice. Real simple. When we, um, when we began our You Matter campaign in high schools, we did so because I began to see that the Lord was really revealing something to me that He wanted us to deal with. And what He was revealing was the necessity of attacking that which was attacking this generation, meaning suicide. You know, suicide is, the old, the old adage is, it's a, it's a permanent solution to a temporary challenge. And I share that a lot with teenagers. And, you know, when, when I began to really, my heart really began to be just, touched in a very significant way for young people and for families who are dealing with what I call hopelessness. And I began to see it in large numbers and I began to do some research and the Lord began to take me and show me and ask me to study certain things. And in the process of all of this, He showed me that every day in America alone, statistically speaking, now I'm just telling you what the natural world says, 5,240 teenagers attempt suicide. That's every, every day. So that being a staggering number, I really believe that God gave us an instruction. And the instruction was to go into an arena and show you what that looks like. And so today, before we even really get in further to the Word and into what it is that God's instructed me to share with you today, he, he spoke to me as I was literally taping right here that he wants me to show you something called our 5240 video. This video is, we shot it in an arena and it shows you, well, it's got about 10 or 12,000 seats in it. And I talk with you from that arena about what this 5240, 5,240 teenagers looks like and why God has commissioned us to do something about it. And I believe you're part of this journey. Take a look, please, at this video from an arena in the Southeast, and we'll be right back. Hey everyone, this is Dean Sykes, founder of You Matter. Since January of 1993, I have ministered to millions of students in high schools across America and in nations around the world. It really is what we're called to do. Today, we're in an arena that seats 12,000 people. As you can see, the arena is it's empty right now, and it's empty on purpose. You see, we prayed about how to offer you a visual of why we were led to create this video in this arena. Well, it's where our praying has led us. What I'm getting ready to share with you is really serious. It's one of the most up-to-date stats pertaining to teenage suicide. You ready for this? Every single day in America, there are an average of 5,000 240 suicide attempts by teenagers in grades 7 through 12 every day. That means that every two and a half days, every single seat in this arena would have a teenager sitting in it who had bought the lie over the previous 60 hours that their death would be a better choice than their life. Think about it. Every single seat. This has to stop. No matter where you are as you're watching this video, no matter how dark it may seem to you, as you look at these empty seats, here's the truth. The Spirit of God made you and the breath of the Almighty gives you life. God has never, ever made a mistake and He's not about to start with you. 
You see, you were created on purpose, with purpose, and yes, for purpose. No matter where you are right now, hear me loud and clear. God loves you. He's not mad at you. You're not alone. You know why? In Him, you really do matter. Today, choose life. Sign our pledge at youmatter.us. God bless you. We'll see you. That video, I hope, really gave you a, a, a very specific idea of what it is that God has commissioned us to do. Not that we're just the, I, I, the, the speaker that goes against suicide. That's, that's not what this is. We are a ministry that talks about life and hope and faith and, and how all of this works together to successfully complete and fulfill a life that pleases God. And we know that to please God, the only way we're going to do that is to live by what? faith, because the word clearly says it. It is impossible to please God without faith. And so when you look at that, that video, and you see that, that the statistically speaking, 5,240 is the number that, that we are been assigned every single day to believe God that does not happen. In all of that, in all of those 5,240 people, I got a question. And the question is simply this, who is your one. That we, we, in a ministry like that God's given us, we get, to, we get to minister, we get to minister to thousands and thousands of teenagers. But you know what, in, in, in all of those students, whether it's 500 in a high, high school gym or, or, or 15,000 in an arena or 35 in a, in a, in a small school somewhere, in, in all of those places that we get to go, you know what I'm constantly looking for? Who's the one? Who's the one that God has instructed me that day to really pour into? And certainly we're going to pour into to everybody who has, who has eyes to see and ears to hear. But who is the one? Because while we're ministering to lots and lots of people, my heart is looking for that one young person who is going, can I make it? Does my life really matter? The video that we just showed you, that was not the video that we had originally that was originally scheduled to be on today's broadcast. That's why living a life that is led by the Holy Ghost is so important. Because as I was taping the, the introduction today, to today's program, as I'm taping, the Spirit of God speaking to me going, I want you to use this video. I remember a long time ago, the Lord asked me a question. He says, do you know what I've called you to do, Dino? And I was like, Lord, I, I've been doing this for decades and I, I sure believe I do, but if you're asking, I'm listening. He said, Dean, you're, you're a messenger. And I, and I got real still and he said, messengers do two things. They, they receive messages, they deliver messages. And he said, for the rest of your life, I want you to do three things for me. I want you to hear my voice, deliver my messages, and share your testimony. Okay. Lord, if you, you anoint me to do that, that's what I'll do the rest of my life. And it looks a little different. I mean, every minute, whether it's on television, whether it's on social media, whether it's in a, in a high school somewhere, whether it's in a church, wherever it is, we're, we're doing those three things. We're, we're hearing, we're delivering, and we're sharing. What about you? What's God called you to do? Who is the one in your life that God has assigned you to reach? And that one might change as seasons change, but you know what? I mean, I look at it this way. Jesus ministered to the masses. He discipled 12. He got really close to three. There's, 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 a, there's a, I think, a, a process there. And I was, I, I was thinking about how, how many times have we stood and shared and ministered and just, you know, through our assemblies or chapel programs, and you see all, like just a sea of faces out there. But then suddenly it's as if a shaft of light comes out of heaven and hits one person and our eyes connect. And I know there, that's the one, that's the one. It happens every time we get to do this. It happens every single time because whether it's during an event or they come up after an event and they, they just, what are they looking for? They're looking for somebody to listen to them. And the Lord told me a long time ago, so you know, teenagers loved, they love to be, to be people to listen to them, but they need to be heard. Ooh, there's a difference. You may be listening right now, but are you hearing with your spiritual ears what God's saying? 
If you have your Bible, let's run over to the book of Mark and let's look at chapter four. Let's start with verse 33. And with many such parables, he, Jesus, spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. So Jesus almost, I mean, if you look throughout the gospels, you'll see he consistently used parables to get his point across. So if you, if you go, you look at chapter four and you realize that he's talking about the parable of the, of the sower. He's, he's talking about how, how growing seed, the, he then talks about the mustard seed. And he, he goes now, verse 34 of Mark four goes, but without a parable, he did not speak to them. And then when he was alone, he explained all of this to his disciples. Now watch verse 35 on the same day that Jesus had just been, he'd been in the teaching ministry. He'd been teaching about the seed, the mustard seed. I mean, he'd been, he'd been ministering to people. On that same day, Jesus says these words, let us cross over to the other side. I love that. Verse 35, they left the multitude. They took him along, along in the boat and little boats were all, so Jesus has ministered to all these people. He now gets in a boat and he goes to, the Bible says he was in the stern and he was asleep on a pillow. Remember, Jesus was here as Jesus, the son of man, not Jesus, the son of God. Point being, he'd been working all day and he was tired. I mean, just like you, you work all day, you, you do whatever it is you do every single day and you're doing it to the best of your ability. By the end of the day, you're tired. I mean, I know for our team, when we get through after a trip and we get home and it's, you know, maybe it's 10 o'clock at night, maybe it's five in the afternoon, maybe it's two in the morning. I promise you, in the natural, we're tired because we've been out doing this. Our spirit is soaring, but we get, Jesus, Jesus was asleep. He's taking a nap. Let's keep going. Verse 37 of chapter four uh, in Mark, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was filling up with water. Jesus was asleep in the stern of the pillow. So his disciples go down, they wake him up and they say this, do you not care that we are perishing? We could stop right there and spend a couple of days, but we won't. Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and he, and, to, and he said to the sea, three words, peace, be still. And immediately the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Golly, can you, I mean, that's not a question I want Jesus to ask me. How, why are you so full of fear and how could you, have, where's your faith? Now then, verse five, I'm sorry, chap, I apologize. Let's look at chapter five. He's just had this moment. He's been ministering. He's been teaching all day. He gets in a boat. He's tired. He goes, he goes to sleep, a big storm. What's the point of the storm in, in, this, in, this, in these verses, you think? Jesus, if you, if you really look at what I'm reading you today, you'll see he's on an assignment. He's going after the one. And every time you and I are on assignment, what happened here? The minute he goes on the, uh, uh, an assignment, what does the enemy do? He throws a storm. He throws something in the face of the disciples that so what grips them with fear because Jesus says, well, his, all these, his own words, how is it that you have no faith? Why are you so fearful? So the storm caused fear. But Jesus tells you in his own words, what gets rid of the fear is faith. Because if you've got faith, you're not going to have fear. Those two cannot live in the same person at the same time. So verse chapter five, then they came to the other side of the sea to the to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he'd come out of the boat immediately, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. So you got this, Jesus and his disciples, they encounter a storm. Jesus says three words, peace be still. The storm stops. His disciples are like, my gosh, he, he speaks three words and the, what we were so afraid of goes away. They land the boat, get out of the boat. And the words clearly, they said immediately, the assignment appears. God, I love this. The assignment appears. This guy who had an unclean spirit, he, he was dwelling among the tombs. No one could bind him, not even with chains because he'd often been bound. Let's, let's go on down. Uh, Jesus, well here, let's just, I'll just read it to you. Verse six, when he saw Jesus, when this guy saw Jesus from afar, he ran toward Jesus. And when he got to him, what did he do? He worshiped him. This is the assignment. Don't miss the question today. The Lord asked me to ask you is who is your one? Who's the one person in your life right now that God is asking you to be on assignment with and for? And he cried out with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Jesus said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Jesus wasn't, Jesus was not 
talking to the man. He was talking to the spirit operating in the man. And he said, come out of him, you unclean spirit, you unclean devil, get out of that guy. You don't, you have no right in this person's life. You know, the, you know, the story that Jesus says, what is your name? And then he said, my name is Legion. Watch this for we, not I, we are many. So the guy's just full of the devil. Now a large, verse 11, now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged Jesus saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at last once, and at once Jesus gave the permission, verse 13, and the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine, about 2,000 of them, and they ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. And those who fed the swine, they, they split. They took, they were like, this is, they ran to the city and they told everybody what just happened. Verse uh, 15 of Mark chapter five, then they came, the people came to Jesus and they saw the guy who had been demon possessed and had the legion within him sitting and clothed in his right mind. And the people kind of got freaked out. And so much so, verse 17 says, the people of the city began to plead with Jesus to depart from the region. Verse 18, and when he got in the boat, the guy tried to go with him. Verse 20, and Jesus departed and began and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus, or the guy departed rather, and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done. Verse 21, this is, what, this is what I want you to see. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. Now, that's a whole lot. And there's some more things that the Lord wants me to share with you. But before we go any further, let, let's kind of recap this. Jesus spent an entire day right? Ministering, teaching, being with people. He then hears from his father to go across the sea because Jesus didn't do anything unless he heard his father tell him to do it, right? He didn't say anything unless he first heard his father say it. So he was going on an assignment because God knew on the other side of that sea, there was a guy who needed to be delivered. And Jesus gets in a boat. He's tired. He's taking a nap. All of a sudden the enemy tries to stop the trip. Jesus gets up because his disciples are pulling on him going, don't you care that we're perishing? He looks at the storm, says three words, peace, be still. The storm stops the, the, and he looks at his disciples and go, why, why are you so fearful and where's your faith? Why are you so fearful and where is your faith? They get to the other side and immediately, the minute they hit the ground, immediately here comes the assignment that God has sent Jesus on, a guy who is full of the devil. And Jesus dealt with the devil. Because you see, it's, you know, people, people aren't our problem. It's the, it's the spirit that operates inside of people. We yield, if, we, listen, if, if we're going to yield to the enemy, that's on us. But it's when Jesus shows up and, and the power of God that resides on the inside of him. And he, he, he speaks and, and, and he commands that that legion of, of, of demons get into 2,000 swine, pigs, and they run violently down a hill. And the, and the guys that are taking care of these 2,000 pigs are like, oh, I'm out. And they take off and they run to the city. And they t can you imagine they're telling everybody what's going on? The city comes out to where Jesus is because Jesus always knows how to draw a crowd. The miracles do that, right? And then they're like, we, you, you, just, we need you to go. And Jesus then has some time with a guy that he had just delivered. And the guy's like, I want to go with you. But Jesus is like, no, I got something for you to do here. You see, when you have a touch from God, that doesn't necessarily mean that God wants you to change everything you're doing, leave what you're doing and go do something. No, grow where you're planted. Let God use you where you are because he needs you right there for a reason. Grow where he plants you. And then Jesus gets in that same boat with his disciples and goes right back across the sea. And what does he do? Immediately, He's right back into his ministry mode. Now, we're going to pick up right there when we come back from our break. Today, our product offer is a book that I wrote called Free to Be Me. It's got a foreword that was written by Brother Copeland. It, it's, it's something that I really know helps a lot of teenagers. And I'm going to encourage you, take a look at this announcement on Free to Be Me. Consider it, pray about it for your family, and I'll be right back with you. 
Since January of 1993, Dean Sykes has spoken at over 3,000 events around the world where he's ministered to millions of teenagers in public, private, Christian, and alternative high schools. One of the benefits of sharing our message of hope with so many students is the interaction Dean has with young people at the conclusion of an assembly or chapel service. In the pages of Free to Be Me, we go back over 25 years and identify 12 of the most personally intimate and socially challenging issues teenagers have again and again talked with us about at the conclusion of our events on the road. In this book, you'll meet 12 of these teens who have faced some pretty intense situations and asked some pretty tough questions. As you read their stories, you'll also be invited to consider word-based solutions that when implemented in your life and done so by faith can overcome these issues. And so whether you're a young person or someone whose life is invested in being there for teens, our prayer for you is that as you read this book, you'll allow John 8.32 to become even more alive in your life. And as you do, the truth you know will do what truth does. It'll make you free. That's free to be me. And again, um, because I've seen so many young people get a copy of this book, it's a, it's a ministry resource for teenagers and those who have a heart for this generation. And again, Brother Copeland wrote a really powerful and, and forward for me on this. And I, I pray that you'll pray about getting your copy of it. So today we're, we're talking about who is your one? Who's the one person right now? And I would encourage you, pray about it. Ask the Lord, Father, who, who is the one person right now in my life that, I, that you want me to minister to? There's an 800 number on your screen. And you know what? I, I would encourage you to pick up that telephone and call. Go, hey, listen, I'm just, I'm calling because I want, I want you to agree with me that God uses me to reach the one that he has instructed me to reach. And that number is for you. It doesn't cost you anything. We pay for it. We, we want it there because we believe so mildly in the power of prayer. Okay, so Mark chapter 5, verse 21 we left off where Jesus had ministered. He's now in the boat. He's going back across the sea. And Jesus in verse 21 says that when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. And he was by the sea. You ever notice how much time Jesus spent by the sea and in the mountains? Didn't just think about that for a little bit. Verse 22, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Now what's the word say? I believed and therefore what? I spoke. So the ruler, this, this, this ruler, Jairus, right? What is he doing? He's, his faith is moving Jesus. He says, it, it, well, let me just read it to you. Lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. That is, the, that is the faith of a dad saying to Jesus, I know you've got this. And if you'll just come to my home and lay hands on my little girl who is sick at, and she's at the point of death, if you'll just lay your hands on her, I know, my God in heaven, I know she's going to be healed. So what happened? Well, let's just read it. Verse 24. So Jesus went with him. We just, let's just stop right there just for a second. The faith moved Jesus to go. You will have to have faith to go after the one that he has for you. Now, let's keep going. Now, as Jesus is going, right? Jesus went with him, verse 24, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Verse 25 he's walking towards the house. But verse 25, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. And she said, if I can only touch, if I may only touch his clothes, I'll be made whole. So don't, don't watch this. The faith of Jairus moved Jesus towards his home. The faith of a certain woman with an issue of blood stopped Jesus in his tracks. The woman with the issue of blood was Jesus's next assignment before he ever got to the daughter. Jesus, you know the story, who touched me? And his disciples were like, who touched you? You're, there's so many people, everybody's touching you. No, no, Jesus said, no, no, I felt power leave me. The healing power inside, that lives on the inside of me left. I know somebody touched me. And you know the story, she was instantly healed. Now, God does things line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Jesus, that day, he had ministered, he had taught, he had gotten in the, in the boat, gone across the sea, encountered a storm, encountered resistance, got there, immediately he saw his one, delivered the guy, 
gets back in the boat, comes right back across the sea. The, instantly when he touches ground, here comes the crowds of people because they're all hungry for Jesus. They, they want the miracles. The, one of the rulers says, my daughter's at the point of death. Come, if you'll just lay your hands on her, she will be made whole. She will be healed. Jesus is now moving because faith has touched Jesus. He's heading in that direction. And then suddenly there's an assignment. There's, there's a one. The woman with the issue of blood and her faith stopped Jesus in his tracks. Now, don't miss this. Jairus is right there beside Jesus. He has to because he's taking Jesus to his own house. And Jesus immediately, verse 30, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd who touched me, verse 34. And he said, Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. She went from a certain woman in verse 25 to a daughter in verse 34. Why? Faith. Now, while he was still speaking, verse 35, some came from the ruler of, synagogue, from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, your daughter is dead. As soon as Jesus heard that word was spoken, he said to the ruler, do not be afraid, only believe. They got to the house. Jesus did not let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and Peter and James and John and the mom and dad and goes in. They ridiculed him. He took the child by the hand, verse 41, and he said, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately, verse 42, the girl arose and walked for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement. She was dead. And Jesus said, I say to you, little girl, arise. We see that Jesus had an assignment of one who was full of the devil. We see that Jesus had an assignment when Jairus touched him and moved him and, and caused us by faith to move forward. We see the next assignment of one was the lady with the issue of blood. Her faith stopped Jesus from going. But then because Jairus saw that Jesus had healed the woman with the issue of blood, his faith had to grow more because faith was in, in, in action here and the, his daughter was alive because of Jesus and his touch. Listen, today, there's a lot we've covered, but you, there's, there's one for you today. Ask God who that is. If you're interested in us coming to your cities, to your schools, we never charge anyone anything. I'm asking you to pray about partnering with our ministry. We're getting ready to go to South Africa and we are believing God to fund the trip. There's, I'm gonna reach over 10,000 teenagers and I'm asking you today to pray about being part of that. If you've never asked Jesus to be Lord of your life, I'm gonna invite you to pray this very simple prayer. Father, I believe that Jesus was sent here by you, that he died for me, that he went to hell so I wouldn't have to, that you raised him from the grave. And today I believe that Jesus is alive, seated at your right hand, talking to you about me. Lord, come live in my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. I invite you to take over my life. Let's just do life together. I'm yours, you're mine. Let's hang out together. I'm saved in Jesus' name. Call the 800 number on your screen. This is not the end. It's a brand new beginning. God has a plan for your life. I'm going to believe God with you. He puts you in a, in a, in a spirit-filled word of faith church that teaches the word of God. Stay tuned into the network. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, faith coming right into your life. If you've got young people in your life, listen, love on them. Let them know how much they matter. Let them know that God has a plan for their life. And remember this, where there is life, there is hope because your life really does matter. See you next time. Today's broadcast was made possible by friends and partners of Dean Sykes and our You Matter campaign. We hope you've been empowered by today's broadcast. You too can make a difference in a teenager's life. Thank you for your continued prayers and support as we hit the road to reach more teens across America and around the world. Remember, where there is life, there is hope. We'll see you next time on our You Matter broadcast with Dean Sykes.